There were two models in Corona's lineup, the PPC400 portable computer and the PC400 desktop. This particular unit has the following specs, 512K of RAM, two 320K 5.25 inch floppy drives, an 8088 processor at 4.77 MHz, and a 9 inch monochrome display at 640 by 325. It retailed for $2,545. I found this particular Corona at a garage sale in dirty but otherwise pretty good condition. It even has the shipping card still installed in the floppy drives. You can see some dirt build up on the keyboard here, but inside the front panel is overall very clean. The same can't be said for the outside, which is covered in smudges. The yellowing effect I originally thought was due to UV is actually nicotine residue as it cleaned off fairly well later. The front panel has these two clasps to reveal the screen and floppy drives. The lid holds your keyboard and cables inside a velcro strap. The original keyboard cable would have been a stretchy spiral type, but it went missing and I had to secure this replacement from Fry's. It's a 6 conductor RJ11. Most phone cords are 2 to 4 conductors, so you'll have to seek out the 6 conductor specifically. Upon first switching it on, I could see it worked, but it quickly started sizzling and blew a huge amount of smoke out the back. Unfortunately, I didn't catch that on camera. The Corona has a two-piece plastic shell with no access doors, so the whole casing has to come off. On the bottom, there are six screws holding the rubber feet on, and another two screws in the front bezel. I had hoped these screws would be the only things holding it together, and with them gone, it would just easily lift up. However, after jiggling it for a few minutes, it still caught on something. Removing the screws from the rear panel allowed for some more wiggle room, and eventually I was able to shimmy the cover off. With plastic this old, I'm always afraid of cracking, so I take a lot of time to make sure I'm removing it the right way. Eventually I was able to lift off the bottom cover. Turning it over, I can now also remove the top cover, which includes the front bezel. And if we start seeing stickers like this, we know we're on the right track. As you can see, the guts of this thing are still completely covered up. Not sure if all these metal panels were for noise shielding or to strengthen the casing when carrying it. So I'm just going to start taking off random covers until we find where our short was. And here we are, lucky first time. That scorch is definitely evidence of a short. Getting a little closer, we can see this capacitor has exploded and let out all its magic smoke. Next to it on this relay, we can see a date stamp of February 1st, 1984. To get this power supply board out, we'll need to remove these connectors. These two smaller ones were the power cord socket and the power switch and now I can remove the back panel completely and have more room to work. And here's a better view of the entire board. These plugs are all different sizes, so there will be no confusion when it comes time to plug them back in. The board itself is held on by four screws, one in each corner. On the back is a California DC model and serial number sticker. Apparently they were outsourcing the power supply boards. In the meantime, I've got several screws lying about, including the ones from the CRT shielding, the back panel, the bezel, and the rubber feet that are on the bottom. Tupperware works good, but I also really like this project mat. It's magnetic and also a whiteboard, so you can stick screws and other parts in each square and then label them. While we've got it open, let's take a peek deeper inside. There's the main board serial number. On this one, they've got the Corona name on it instead of contracting out to another manufacturer. This is also where your four expansion cards would go. Over here, there's a blank socket for another chip, and I'm not sure what, what exactly that's for. And you can also see the top of the floppy drive here. I'm used to having the floppy drives with some sort of casing on top, but these are completely exposed. I guess with all the other cover panels it wasn't really needed. 
Looking on the other side, you can see there's not much room under the CRT there for the sea of chips populating this board. And here's some sort of factory bodge going on between these two chips. Again, I'm not sure what this was trying to fix. Back to the power supply board, I find that removing components is really easy by just heating up the solder joint while giving a little pull on the component to be removed. Once the solder melts, the pins just slide right out. Sometimes you have to go back and forth between each pin and sort of seesaw the thing out. Now that the capacitor is out, you can also see a burn mark on the board as well. Thankfully it doesn't seem to have damaged anything else. The original capacitor was a 250 volt, this one is a 630. That's not a problem as you can always go up in voltage but never down. It was a .22 microfarad capacitor and I found this replacement at Fry's for about 75 cents. Now, the size is about the same, but not close enough for the pins to match with the holes. So I'll need to bend the leads a little bit, but not before dropping it on the floor. I'll just give this one lead over here a little zigzag bend. Thankfully the leads on these are fairly soft. And yeah, that looks like it'll match up just fine. I'm going to flip the board over and use this desoldering iron to remove the excess solder. It uses a rubber bulb to suck the melted solder up into the head, after which you can blow it into the trash. It does take quite a while to heat up, but it works pretty good once it does. Now that the holes are clear of solder, we can push the leads of the new capacitor through. Bending them out a little bit will hold it in place while we solder. I'm no expert at soldering, far from it in fact, but you want to hold the soldering iron to the joint needing to be soldered. This will heat up the two components we're trying to join together. Then you hold your solder to that joint, letting it flow into place. If you hold the solder to the iron, then it will melt into a little ball that won't make a good connection between the capacitor lead and the board. It takes a lot of practice, but you'll get the hang of it eventually, and don't be afraid to have to redo it all over again. After successfully soldering the leads, I'll snip off the extra. There, that almost looks just like factory. Now we can slide the board back in and screw it into place. Then reconnect all the wires. I actually end up screwing the back panel in place here and then I'll have to remove a few of those screws because I forget which ones hold the plastic casing on. This little screw behind the handle here is a real pain in the butt to get to. The casing itself takes a little wiggling to get back on. It's not the easiest thing to line up. The top part with the bezel is the harder of the two. Once it's on, the bottom piece lines up rather easily and dropped right on without a fuss. Lastly, let's put the rubber feet back on. This also includes the metal stand that gives the 
computer a bit of an angle to make it easier to read while you're sitting at a desk. Alright, let's flip it back over and here's the moment of truth. The switch is on the back and fingers crossed. Bingo! <laughs> Looks like we're in business. Let's also see if the disk drive works while we're up here. I'll just slide this DOS boot disk in. And you can see the light came on. Making noises. And yep, it's asking for a date, so the disk drive works. Now that we've got a fully functioning PC, let's try and make it look a little better. I started trying some all-purpose cleaner with a toothbrush to loosen the dirt from the texture of the plastic, and then wiping it off with a paper towel. This seemed to work okay, but it took quite a long time and there's still some stubborn spots. As you can see, even after all that scrubbing, there's still some darkened residue on the cover. It did reveal one rather prominent scratch, but unfortunately there's not much I can do about it. Next, I tried a magic eraser on one of these scuff marks. And hey, that works ten times better than the toothbrush. So I went ahead and scrubbed the top again with the eraser, and wow, that really does look a lot better. What I had initially thought was some yellowing from UV was actually just nicotine buildup. Flipping it to the back again, I used the toothbrush to loosen the dirt and all the crevices and wiped it up with a paper towel. This vanguard, however, must have had nuts on the inside because these screws would not back out. So instead of disassembling the entire thing again, I tried to brush most of the dust out with the toothbrush but it really wasn't doing that great of a job as the bristles simply were too short. So instead I got this brush that I used to clean the wheels on the car with much longer bristles and that got it very clean. Moving to the front, it really just needed a little dusting in these grooves in the corners along with a simple wipe down of the CRT. Now, the keyboard has a fair amount of gunk on these keys, and it's also missing a rubber foot. The foot will be easy to replace, as any hardware store will sell replacements of these. I started by removing the keycaps, and wow, that's pretty unusual. The key mechanism is not like any I've ever seen before. As the plastic button is pushed down, it allows these two fingers to touch and complete the contact. It's not quite mechanical, but it's not a rubber dome either, it's sort of somewhere in between. Anyway, I set to work removing all the keys, and you can see there was a fair amount of gunk under them as well. Using the narrow attachment on the vacuum and the toothbrush to lift the fluff worked pretty well, and it's looking a lot better now. I left the space bar on because it has an unusual metal bar and it was really a pain in the butt to get off so I thought it would be better to leave it be. I carefully cleaned the keys with a magic eraser and now the board is looking almost new again. The padded straps that hold the keyboard in can be taken out by removing these screws. The lid simply needed some wiping out to remove dust from the corners. I again use the magic eraser on the outside to remove the nicotine buildup and some other smudges. Six screws and the straps are back on and we're ready to pack the cables and keyboard into the lid. It's a little bit difficult to get them to lie flat enough so that the keyboard will fit underneath the strap, but it'll fit in the end. And now we're ready to take our business on the go and get quite the arm workout while you're at it. This thing has to weigh a good 30 or 40 pounds. 
After all, we've got very important work to be done now that we're mature adults. 